<laughs> Hi everyone, welcome to my science journey. Today I am so excited because I am hosting some of my favorite people in Oxford. We have Professor Kevin Marsh, who's a professor of tropical medicine at the University of uh, Oxford. He is a global health researcher who has spent most of his career living and working in Africa. Um, I would say this as a fun fact that, you know, when I was meeting Kevin for the first time and I was like, you've stayed in Kenya for more than I have existed in this life. So that was uh, interesting. Um, he founded or he established uh, a series of research projects on malaria in Kilifi. This is on the Kenyan coast in 1989, which subsequently developed into an international program working on all aspects of health in East Africa. Uh, where he was director until 2014. So for those who don't know this, this is the Cambridge Wellcome Trust Research Program that is based off Kilifi in Kenya. So Kevin has a particular interest in research capacity and scientific leadership in Africa, which has subs subsequently formed the basis for the Science for Africa Foundation. So if you haven't heard of Science for Africa, I think it's about time you, <laughs> you do some Googling. Uh, it's a very fantastic initiative. All right, so from 2016, he worked with colleagues to establish, uh, to establish the Africa Oxford Initiative, which is what you're featuring today, and AFOX, uh, as we call it, aims to make Africa a strategic priority for the University of Oxford and to facilitate new approaches to equitable partnerships across all academic disciplines. And we are pleased to have uh, Kevin here with us. And I'll jump straight in and, uh, you know, start on a light note. Uh, Kevin, do you want to share a fun fact with us before we start the session? <laughs> I never know what counts as a, as a fun fact. Um, but uh, um, I, I guess what when people ask me about this, things that they might not necessarily expect that I've been involved with. I guess I guess one of the uh, ones was I used to be very keen on climbing, and when I was at uh, university, instead of spending most of my time in um, uh, in the lecture theatre, I was always going away doing things. And one of the things I did in the in the night I can't believe now that it's so long ago in the nineteen <laughs> seventies in nineteen seventy six was a uh, climb in a, a Himalayan expedition, uh, which was oh. incredibly exciting, incredibly exciting. Yeah. Oh, nice, nice, nice. And now that you're in Kenya, did you get to climb Mount Kenya? Oh, yeah, th uh, three times so far. Oh, wow. I'm, sure I'll be, wow. I'm sure I'll do it again. I'm sure I'll do it again as well. Three times. OK. Yeah. OK, that's a challenge because I haven't done it even once. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Uh, cool. So yeah, we'll start uh, the conversation about you know your career path and research interests. Mm -hmm. I mean, people would be wondering, you know, why were you so keen on establishing malaria research in East Africa? Why did you choose tropical medicine? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I. You know, one thing to say at the beginning um, is that I'm always a little bit doubtful when people give an account of their you know, story, as it were, when people say, why did you do this? Why did you do that? So this is almost like a this is almost like a, a warning, as it were, that I think people <laughs> often make up in retrospect the reason yeah. they did things. You know, you go yeah. through life largely accidentally. And yeah. then later on, you explain yeah. it and say, well, I decided to do this. I decided <laughs> to do that. So that's my if you like my my preemptive warning. Yeah. Um, I think what actually happened was once I qualified, I did medicine at Liverpool. Um, as I say, I had many other interests outside medicine. And when I qualified, um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I knew what I didn't want to do. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be bored. And I didn't I wasn't attracted to the kind of career that was, you know, normal, I guess, for young doctors in those days, probably still is, yeah. where you go through all your training and then you rise up the ladder and then you become a whatever, a consultant or a GP or whatever. And then, you yeah. know, that's it for your life. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, you know, many of my colleagues did that and they've had great um, experiences and great careers, but I just didn't want to do that. So it wasn't that I knew what I did want to do, but I just didn't want to do that. So I was really interested in kind of um, international politics and international events um, and development. And because Liverpool has a school of tropical medicine, the, the natural thing mm -hmm. to do was to 
go along to do tropical medicine. So it wasn't with any aim. It was just avoiding doing other yeah. things that I ended up at yeah. the tropical school. So, But then from there, I became interested in malaria um, as a result of a course of lectures I attended by Sir Ian McGregor, who was one of the UK's main uh, leaders, as it were, in malariology in those days. And he gave a course of lectures on the immunology of malaria. And I know it sounds a bit sort of corny, but after two of those lectures, I just thought, yep, this is definitely what I'm going to do for my career. And from then on, it was it was obvious what I was going to do. All right. Oh, OK, great. So was that so how then did you move from Liverpool to Africa? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I. I began to speak to people about I, you know, wanting to do malaria. And they said, well, you need to get a yeah. research fellowship and such like. And I was very lucky. I was put in touch with Brian Greenwood. Brian Greenwood is a very uh, uh, eminent British um, tropical medicine, global health person. Um, he's at the London School. Um, in those days, he was director of the MRC unit in the Gambia in West Africa. Mm -hmm. And in those days, of course, there were no mobile phones or anything like that or no email. So I had to ring him on a landline in the Gambia. Yeah. And he said, I want, to come, I want to come and do malaria with you. And yeah. he was incredibly helpful. And we met up when he was next in the UK and arranged for me to do my fellowship in the Gambia. So I that's how I ended up going out to West Africa. <laughs> and then... Um, and that experience was repeated through my career of people being incredibly yeah. helpful. Um, at the same time, I did the same thing with Lou Miller, who's a very famous American malariologist. And I rang him out of the blue and said, you don't know me. I'm a young doctor in the UK. I'm going to work yeah. with Brian Greenwood. Um, can I come to NIH and be in your lab? And he said, yeah, just come. And that's, I mean, it sounds crazy now, but he said let me know what plane you're on and when I got there he met me at the airport and I spent time in his lab and so all through my career I've had a lot of luck in meeting people who've been very supportive so that's how I've ended up sort of going into malaria. Oh that's that's really great and I, I, I concur with you that you know having people that support you through your career is like one of the best things mm. it mm. helps with smooth sailing so yeah I'm glad to hear that you had that and you know you're also paying it forward I mean I like to use paying it forward first but you <laughs> you're also it. doing the same yeah. sort of things uh for others so let's talk about a bit of Cambry Welcome Trust you know how mm -hmm. did you get up to, uh how did you get to set up the the program and you know it has evolved yeah. to become something big in in Africa yeah. generally so yeah let's talk about yeah. that yeah well again as I said at the beginning I think a lot of things are a bit accidental uh, mm -hmm. after three years in the Gambia I wanted to um, uh, I wanted to kind of get up to speed with molecular immunology um, but not with the intention of working in the UK in the long term it was always my intention to establish um, my group you know, it, uh, you know when you're a young researcher you, you think in terms of what, what do I want to do what, what do I want to build a group it was always my intention to do it in a malaria endemic area because it seemed mm. crazy to me that you know one should not be working on malaria in a malaria endemic area so yeah. but I wanted to get skilled up in in more molecular parasitology so I came to Oxford for a couple of years um, with the intention of going back to the Gambia, and by accident, um, I was um, I went to a meeting in Kenya, uh, met Bill Watkins, who was then leading a group in Nairobi, um, and uh, ended up going down to Kalifi to have a look around, um, and deciding this would be a great place to mm -hmm. to think about working. Um, welcome trust. Hmm. Yeah, so that's how I that's how I ended up um, uh, going to Kalifi in the first place. Um, but in yeah. those days, of course, Kalifi was very different from uh, those of you who know Kalifi now. Um, mm -hmm. In those days, Kalifi was a very small town, uh, very isolated um, on the coast. There's no bridge across, for instance. So um, you have okay. to go by ferry if you're coming up from Mombasa. Um, so we just I put in a grant application. Um, um, got a grant to work on um, malaria and uh, myself and a few colleagues went out to begin that work um, and it grew from there. And it's a bit hard to describe really how it changed from sort of eight or nine of us to eight or nine hundred of us 
but it did over 25 years things grew and grew and grew and i guess the work expanded more people wanted to come and work uh, with us and it just developed over over time to become a large research center yeah, 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 and I and I totally agree. As someone who's been affiliated with with Kemri Wellcome Trust, I mean, studying in Pwani and going to do research mm -hmm. in Kemri Wellcome Trust, I can attest to that. And it's really great work that you pioneered there. And you know, you need to receive your flowers for that. So yeah, um, <laughs> so yeah, that's great. So now that we've talked about malaria, you know, establishing Kemri Wellcome Trust, um, I think it's it's fair if we move towards, you know, now you shifted. I don't know whether you shifted really because I think you still do a bit of research, mm -hmm. but then right now you're doing more uh, in terms of capacity building on developing mm -hmm. research mm -hmm. capacity and leadership in Africa. Yeah. So can you yeah. talk to us about that shift and how that is yeah. important for the continent? Yeah, yeah. yeah it, 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 I guess it was a shift in the sense that for most of my career, I was leading my own research group and then also obviously leading the center. Um, so it was a shift in the sense that my day to day work became much more over the last 10 years uh, around um, scientific ecosystems and leadership, uh, both with Science for Africa um, yeah. in, in Kenya and with and with APOX. But it wasn't a shift in the sense of suddenly I decided to do something else. It was a, it yeah. was a natural conclusion of mm. what I'd been doing for the previous 25 years or so. And I said to you earlier that when I originally was working in West Africa, I had already decided at that point that I didn't want to build my own you know, interests in in the UK, although that would have been more logical from a scientific point of view. And that was because in those days, um, uh, everyone was very excited in the 1980s yeah. uh, mm -hmm. about the possibility of malaria vaccines. And one thing mm -hmm. that struck me was that all the meetings I went to Mm -hmm. uh, there were no there were no African researchers there, um, mm -hmm. and that wasn't because they were excluded. It was because mm -hmm. in the 1980s there were yeah. very very few um, African researchers with PhDs. Um, this yeah. was only 20 years after independence for most countries, yeah. and I decided at that point that you know if I was going to work in malaria, which is you know it's essentially a disease of endemic countries and particularly of Africa then yeah. I really had to work in that setting and I had to you know, work with colleagues to develop the field, as it were. So it was a logical process for me to become involved with how do you develop the yeah. infrastructure and the ecosystems and leadership. And so I suppose when I stepped down from Khalifi, from leading yeah. Khalifi, yeah. Um, it, was a, it, was a, it was an obvious thing to do was move in more in that direction. So it wasn't a sudden change. It was, a, yeah. it was an obvious development of what I was already doing. Thank you so much for sharing that, Kevin. Yeah, and you know, I think it's it's very very good initiative that you and so many others are doing for Africa because I think a lot of times we we talk about having a seat at the table, but you know, getting opportunities to actually put you there, mm -hmm. uh, you have to sort of first develop your skills, not only the technical skills but also the leadership aspects and the soft skills. So it's important that uh, you know you and others are doing this. And we are getting more Africans to the table right now. You know, we have a lot of African researchers that are doing, you know, great yeah. uh, initiatives yeah. across the continent. So I'm yeah. going to take a pause uh, so that, you know, uh, you can digest that information and ask people to, you know, if you have a question for Kevin, can you please type it in the chat uh, or if you would want to talk, uh, to speak then uh, you'd raise your hand, uh, but that would be later on. But if you want to sort of like type it, this is the time so you can start typing. So when we start taking questions, it's it's faster and easier. So yeah, please type in the chat box. Also tell us where you're joining us from. Is it in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, UK, wherever you're joining us from, type your country uh, so that we can see the representation and the diversity in, in the call. Yeah, so um, so I'm gonna uh, go back to the conversation, Kevin. You know, and talk about the elephant in the room, which is Africa Oxford Initiative. I mean, uh, I have been part of AFOX for just two years, but I feel like you know I've been part of it for <laughs> my lifetime here yeah. uh, because it's been an incredible community. You know, not only uh, offering scholarships, but you know the leadership. Uh, um, 
sessions, the social sessions, you know, all these academic sessions toward building someone to become, you know, not only, uh, you know, good in terms of achieving their careers, but also an all round sort of person. So, yeah, let's talk a bit about AFOX, you know, um, since it was, uh, I think we, I do not think we hosted an, uh, a few, <laughs> I think a few weeks ago or so. But yeah, I think, can you speak about some of the, you know, significant milestones that AFOX has achieved since it was yeah. Uh, founded? Yeah. Well, it's nice that you say such positive things about AFOX. I'm very happy about that. Um, uh, I guess the milestones, um, well, firstly, was getting AFOX going. I mean, uh, we began these discussions in around about 2015, 2014, 2015, when I stepped down from Khalifi and I began to spend time in Oxford. I wanted to find out what was going on in Oxford in relation to Africa. I knew very well about um, health research, of course, but I wanted to know all the other things that were happening. And what I realized was there was no um, there was no where no place where it was all brought together. I also wanted to meet African students and see what their experience of being in Oxford was. And it was at that time that I had a great good luck. And maybe Anne talked about this. I don't know. I didn't see Anne's um, podcast. But That's I, had a great right. good luck. I had the great good luck to meet with Anne at the time, who at the time was a DPhil student finishing her DPhil. And we realized we got very similar interests uh, in terms of African research and collaboration. So we began to work together. And so the first milestone was actually getting people to come together and mm. agree to create a platform. Um, um, which was Apox, and that was in 2016. And after that, each step seemed like a milestone in one sense. You know, we established, um, we had very little funding. So the, you know, the next milestone was getting a bit of funding and then getting the travel grants going and the fellowships going. So at each step, and then eventually the innovation platform. So I guess every step along the way is a kind of milestone, but I guess the two big ones that, you know, are, are more obvious our firstly was when we had the major investment from the MasterCard Foundation oh, to enable oh. us to move our scholars program from being quite a small scholars program. Um, but we were, you know, we were very happy to have investments from different partners in our yeah, scholars program. Yes. But the MasterCard Foundation was a really massive input and has enabled us to really kind of scale up the ambition in terms of total numbers and, you know, I think we were talking earlier. Next week, we've got 70 new scholars arriving. So that's mm -hmm, fantastic. Mm -hmm. so that was a big milestone. And another yeah. milestone, I think, was last year when we were very fortunate to win the Vice Chancellor's Award. Um, yeah. So that kind of gave us great profile across the university. And so I guess they're milestones that I would sort of point to. Yeah, that's, I mean, I, I can speak you know, days on end about AFOX, <laughs> but you know, this is this is just speaking about it. And, you know, Kevin, um, you know, we see the milestones. I mean, as scholars and as people from the outside, we see the milestones and we see the efforts that, you know, uh, the, the entire team puts to ensure that, you know, the scholars, uh, the, you know, researchers that are affiliated with AFOX are actually having a good time here in Oxford or even just in the continent mm -hmm. as well. But, you know, sometimes we, not even sometimes, I don't think we see the challenges that the team mm -hmm. encounters. So maybe you could speak to us about, you know, some of the challenges that, you know, uh, anyone that is thinking about starting an, such an initiative, you know, could potentially encounter when, you know, you're trying to build mm -hmm. research partnerships between um, an mm -hmm. institution abroad and an African institutions and, you know, how you've, you know, you could just speak about a few of them or even one of them and how you've managed yeah. to go through that, to, to, yeah. to encounter that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, with challenges, I mean, I guess you've got kind of specific individual challenges always. You yeah. know, and then they're the challenges of getting getting funding and, and so on and so forth. But I think the, the, the bigger challenge perhaps that you might be referring to is uh, more of a, a historical and a contextual challenge which is not personalized by which i mean you know the history of collaboration between um, uk institutions or institutions across um, uh, um, industrialized countries and 
African institutions has not always been well balanced. It's obviously not well balanced. And this is a historical fact. It reflects colonialism, it reflects the balance of power, and reflects funding, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, yeah. at an individual level, people don't want to encapsulate that, but they're kind of trapped in that way of working, if you see what I mean. So I think yeah. one big challenge is to is to um, bring everyone to a position of seeing that that is the context and that that fundamentally has to change and that there has to be a shift in the balance of power in yeah. uh, in partnerships so to me that's the, the if you like the key you know the key thing that we that we and many other people are trying to do is to recognize the the the, con the context and very specifically make sure we don't repeat the mistakes that have been yeah. put and, I, I won't say forced on us, but you know what I mean? I, it isn't that individual people wanted to work in a particular way. It's just the system you find yourself in. So you've got to kind of be open eyed and recognize that and say, no, the power balances aren't right. So what do, what, what do we do to address that? And they'd be, they'd be things like making sure that, you know, the funding goes to an African institution rather than to a yeah. UK institution. You know, they're, they're straightforward things, but you have to recognize them and try and make sure that you put in place the processes to address those kind of historical imbalances. Yeah, yeah, and and I totally agree. I mean, I think a, a few of those things are slightly starting to change, but we are hoping yeah. that, you know, as we move forward that we'll see, you know, <laughs> Sorry, I'm starting to become emotional, but yeah, I hope that moving forward, we, you know, we'll get more progress from that. Oh, and, they're definitely um, changing. Yeah, yeah. They're definitely changing. As you said earlier, there are now, you know, I, one of the most exciting things, um, I think, when you look across now is, I mean, you can always you can always look at things as there's a long way to go. But when I look across the landscape now, I'm really excited by the fantastic number of young African researchers showing, you know, enormous leadership in different areas so things are changing for sure uh, yeah. which doesn't mean yeah. doesn't mean we don't need to change more but i yeah i think you're right things have really changed enormously and are and will continue to change yeah absolutely absolutely so i'll take a pause here and take questions from the audience so yeah. if you have a question please uh raise your hand um so you can uh, ask it otherwise you can type it in the chat but i think to be faster if you could raise your hand and ask your question. So yeah, well, we are still waiting for that, Kevin. Maybe, you know, um, the other question for me would be, as someone who's worked extensively in tropical medicine and global health, you know, what do you envision as the next big challenge? And, <laughs> you know, what's, the global scientific community can prepare for or can work towards? Yeah. Well, I guess, you know, the lesson of COVID was that you can't always know what the next big challenge is. So I think in, in many ways, the next big challenge is the unknown things, you know, and, it, it, and I think now we're all aware that, that of the possibility of pandemics, uh, not just Ebola, um, there are many other potential pandemics. So that's always, you know, potentially there. Um, you can think of the next big challenge either in terms of specific areas of health, you know, sort of um, non-communicable diseases is a massive challenge, which, you know, needs more emphasis. I think mental health um, yeah. is a massive challenge. But if you had to identify one thing i mean i think it has to be the overall effect of the climate crisis because that mm -hmm. is going to affect absolutely everything you know for all of us um and across africa in particular across the continent um, yeah. it, it, it will be different in different places but if there's one big driver that's going to affect every aspect of health and yeah. health delivery then it, it's the climate crisis Mm. And and as we continue to speak about the crisis and, you know, about the potential that we have in the continent. So for people like Anita Makori, sorry, I'm putting you on the spot, <laughs> who are working in uh, global health, uh, you know, young African scientists that are working or aspiring to work in global health, what would be, what would be your advice to them? 
Oh, I see. What would be my advice to Anita, or or, or Anita's advice to other people? Well, I wasn't quite cl cl clear. No, no, no. Your you advice to Anita. Anita is working in global health, so yeah, no, I know to it. Anita and I other people Anita. that <laughs> work in global yeah. health. Yeah. 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 Um, well, oh, gosh, my advice it, 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 it depends. You know, obviously, what what say you're in, but in general, the advice I yeah. would give to people is to, um, firstly expose yourself to as many possibilities as possible because at the beginning of a career you often as i was saying to you you often don't know what you want to do and mm. it's very tempting to sort mm. of do what somebody else is doing to you know exactly. to see someone say oh, yes. i want to do that but i think it's really important to expose yourself to the whole field and i think you know great opportunity for people have money when they uh, so for instance those people who come to oxford to do global health yeah. is having the opportunity to talk to people across many many different areas um and find out what it is that really excites you because whatever you do you've got to be excited about it you know a lot yeah. of people yeah. come along and say oh i want to do malaria but then you say well what do you want to do in malaria and they say well i don't know i just want to do malaria <laughs> and i always encourage people to just find out what are the many things you could do do you want to be an epidemiologist do you want to be an immunologist yeah. do you want to be a policy person and the only way to find that out is to actually go to loads of seminars, talk to loads of people and find out where your passion really lies. And yeah. then having found out where your passion lies, be enthusiastic, throw yourself into it. Um, yeah. be, be persistent. I mean, a lot of people write to me, you know, looking for openings and opportunities. And I think they're often disappointed when you can't say, you know, straight away, you can do this. But what I've found over the years is that the people who are persistent in the end yeah. get there now there's a balance in being persistent being persistent doesn't mean writing every week to somebody um because <laughs> yeah. that, gets a little, that gets a little bit too much but you know what i mean yeah. you have to you have to be persistent once you've got a clear view of what you want to do you have to identify what do i need to do to get there do i need a master's yeah. do i need a phd do i need that do i want to be a researcher or do i want to be in health delivery you know you have to work all this out and then having yeah. worked it out be persistent and be really enthusiastic and passionate about it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And I love the aspect about exploring and being open to explore different opportunities and mm -hmm. seeing what you're actually passionate about and pursuing what you're passionate about and not just yeah. what is available. All right, so I'll hand it over to Francis who has a question. Uh, Francis, go yeah. ahead. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Ruth and Kevin, and uh, first of all, let me thank Kevin for the work he has done for Kenya, uh, developing the capacity for science in Kenya uh, uh, for the many years that you are in Kilifi and motivated some of us, although we never got to be your students or work in the labs in Kilifi, but your work has motiv motivated some of us. So my, my question is, uh, uh, I'm asking on behalf of many young people who ask me this, um, how do I identify uh, a course? Because mm -hmm. if you're familiar with the training in Kenya and maybe yeah. yeah. Sub-Saharan Africa, the exposure to the future and research is very low, even after uh, uh, undergraduate training. Now, yeah. someone is thinking they want to do a postgraduate program and they keep asking, or oh, how do I identify a course? How do I uh, align my passion yeah. to, to my risk to the future of uh, this uh, academics and research and my yeah. career aspirations? So that's a, a big question that uh, I face uh, yeah. from many students. Uh, yeah. Maybe you can help speak to it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Francis. Uh, really nice to talk with you. Um, I so I think this goes a little bit to what Ruth and I were just talking about. It's um, you need to talk to lots of people um, and ask people, and and of course the great advantage now compared with you know um, sort of 10, 20, 30 years ago is that one can talk to people because of the uh, access through to things like this teams chats zooms you know you're not restricted to only talking to people 
um, who you're actually working with. So, you know, there's a great network, and I guess you're part of it, and all the people on this um, call are part of it, of African uh, researchers, students, um, academics, um, in both in Kenya, across Africa, and, and across the rest of the world, and talk to people, you know, ask, ask them, what was your experience of this? When you were looking at this, what did you find? And out of that, you know, you draw on other people's um, experience. One of the great, um, I think, you know, things that's happened um, is there are really good graduate and postgraduate courses in many African countries now. Um, and now, of course, historically, um, it wasn't always easy to do a, a master's that you wanted to do. Um, this, the subject expertise wasn't always there. The facilities weren't always there. But increasingly, there are really high quality opportunities to do masters and PhDs, which are internationally competitive. So whereas in the past, maybe people felt they always had to go elsewhere. And often, I mean, there's a good reason to go elsewhere. I'm not saying one shouldn't. Obviously, we, we have many master's students come to, to Oxford. But I think to me, the good thing is that's not the only option now. Um, and in particular, what I would point people towards are the Deltas programs. So the Deltas programs were are now 14 very large programs uh, involving many countries, many institutions across Africa, um, which I was really uh, fortunate and privileged to be able to actually design them by invitation uh, originally from the Wellcome Trust, but they're now run through Science for Africa. Um, and these programs all run fantastic master's programs and PhD programs. Um, and the training in those programs is comparable with training you know, anywhere in the world. So I think that's really a big advantage now for people that you it's great if you come to Oxford, it's great if you go to the States or Australia, or whatever. But that's not the only option anymore. It's, it's really possible to access fantastic programs across Africa. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Kevin. I hope that answers your question, Francis. And just, uh, Kevin, so you know, uh, Francis is the head of human re uh, research in Mount Kenya University. And oh, fantastic. And he does a lot of cancer research as well. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, in fact, now I know who Francis is. In fact, we've been on an email together, I think probably linked by um, Jessica Taka. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so now I understand. I didn't recognize who Francis was just from the name because, um, but now you explained it. Yeah, great. Before we let you go from Lena, Lena yeah. is joining from Camry Welcome Trust. Yeah, great. and um, Lena is asking, How do you manage long term career satisfaction <laughs> and maintain work life balance? Uh, yeah. and then maybe let's answer that first and then we answer the second. Okay. Time. OK, this is such a personal thing, and I'm not sure I'm the right person to ask because I'm not sure if you ask my I'm not sure if you ask my friends and family whether they say I got life work balance or not. I think I think the only thing I can say is. It is important to have this in mind, you know, and to not it is really important to be passionate about your work and to be committed to it. And if you are passionate and committed, you inevitably spend long hours on it. But it's also important to recognize that, you know, to be. I think good at doing something and useful to other people, you've got to also have other interests. So I think bear, just having it in mind and very deliberately freeing up time um, to do other things, but particularly to engage with other people and obviously with family and, and friends. So I don't think there's a magic to how you maintain that. And for every person, that balance will be different. But I think what is important is to recognize yeah. that it is important and to consciously from time to time, ask yourself, you know, am I maintaining that balance? Are there, uh, and to ask one's family and friends, you know, sort of, they'll tell you if, if, if they feel you're not maintaining that balance. So I think just being conscious of it, but the solutions will be different for everybody. Everyone's got a different sort of work-life balance. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I must highlight that Kevin is, so, is also very active in terms of sports. So <laughs> he, also, <laughs> he, he tries to do the, the, the life balance work uh, um, really well. I actually emulate, no, I don't emulate, I admire that. <laughs> I just haven't gotten to that point yet. But yeah, uh, thank you you. So the second bit of the question is, apart from research and academia, what mm -hmm. are other opportunities that yeah. you think someone who is currently bu building a career in 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 science would 
benefit from. Yeah, I think this is really important too. Uh, and I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier about working out what it is you might be interested in. Sometimes when you get into an academic environment, there's a sense that oh, I've got to be a researcher, I've got to do a PhD, I've got to get this, I've got to do that. And it's not for everybody. You know, research is a very specific thing and it's hard. It's a hard career. And yeah. um, and so I think it's really important that one looks at those other options. And the other options include things like, obviously, there's industry. Many, many people who train in research end up in industry. And that's really important. Yeah. We need, particularly across the continent, we need yeah. vaccine production. We need drug production. We need products. Yeah. So I think going in that direction, either, you know, within a large organization or if you are so minded, in a much more entrepreneurial way, you know, innovation is so important. So I think thinking about outside of research, um, whether it's innovation or working with big companies, that's an option. But there are many other options, of course, as well. There are um, communication, you know, communication in science is really important. Quite a lot of my colleagues who trained in research have moved more into the policy or the communications sphere. Yeah. Or there is moving into working in Government, people often, government or other bodies, you know, international bodies. Um, yeah. Uh, people always say, oh, it's a waste if you've trained in research and now you're doing something. And I would say, think, no, what we really need is people of research literate at every level. So if you exactly. decide what yeah. I really want to do is work in the Ministry of Health or work in the Ministry of Education, that's great because, you know, the more research experienced people have got mm -hmm. who are in policy making positions, the better. So yeah. I think it's a really wide. And again, the answer is talk to lots of people, find out what yeah. other people have done with their careers, find out what, you know, what it what it's like to move out of research. Don't feel yeah. you've got to stay in research just because you're in research. And I absolutely agree with that, Kevin. And before we let you go, I think there's someone else who has a question. But before sure. we wrap up, I just want to highlight that uh, this is exactly what we do at MSJ. We try to highlight all the different pathways that you could take uh, as, a, as someone who's pursuing a career in science that, you know, you don't have to stick to academia. There are other avenues yeah. that you could, you know, uh, explore. So make sure to join our MSJ sessions and you get to meet all these people that are doing different things, but they started from, you know, the academia angle. So final yeah. question. I think I've kept on saying final question, <laughs> but because someone has raised their hand, let me just yeah. give them an opportunity. So David, go ahead. David? Oh, oh, sorry, yes. Thank you, Ruth and Kevin, for this opportunity. So my question, my question is, um, I don't know even how to ask it. I just want you to like measure up between a person who, after finish, finishing their bachelor's, they just took a master's and then went straight to a PhD. And then maybe someone after finishing their bachelor's, uh, they just took another job maybe in healthcare healthcare committee, you know, like they took a detour, then before they did their master's, yeah. Yeah. And then maybe before they continue advancing their career. Like, um, how do you measure up these two parts? And is one more superior than the other or something? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, they're not, they're not. And, you know, I think it's great to bring up this example. And it comes back to what I was saying about, you have to experience lots of things to work out what you want to do. Some people know from day one, they want to do their master's, they want to do a PhD, and they want to go straight into a postdoctoral position. And they know that, and that's great. Other people don't know that. And what you shouldn't feel is, oh, I must do this because all my colleagues are saying they're going to do it. And I think it's good to take detours. I think it's great to spend a year in industry or a year out doing something else, so long as you're continuing to you know, be open to new experiences. There's obviously a limit to that. You know, after 10 years of moving from one thing to another, it's got to get harder and harder to get back into research. So there's a, you know, I wouldn't recommend doing this forever. But I think um, you can go any of those routes. So I don't think it's a matter of one's better than the other. I think the key thing is to find out what it is you really want to do. And for different people, that happens at different times. So we often have this, you know, on the on the on the master's course I teach on on international health and tropical medicine. People often after halfway through the year say they're really confused. They don't know what they want to do next. You know, should they be applying for a PhD? 
And I always say to people, look, if, if you don't know, then don't apply for a PhD just because everyone else is doing it, because it's yeah. so hard yeah. work. It's so hard work. You've got you've got to know what you want to do. So give yourself time, you know, do an internship somewhere. Go and go and get other experiences. Yeah. So I'm glad you asked that question. And I, to me, the answer is there's no one route. It has to be what you what works for you.